Jesus was able to believe in some of the things that are seemingly absurd. So I can too. You know what I mean? I didn't understand these fancy doctrines. I didn't understand a lot of what the Bible taught, but I believe. Hello, this is Michael Beverly. Welcome to my channel. Now there you can hear what is a common thing that these apologists don't like to admit or openly talk about. There's Melissa admitting that she just believed. I didn't understand like the Trinity. I became, I became a Christian. I believed. I believed, and I was a radically different person the next day after I believed the gospel. Now, there you have it. Melissa didn't understand the Trinity. Well, she had been a Christian one night. Um, she had a, she was a new ager. She had this experience, an emotional experience, and she believed in Jesus, and she was a new person by her own testimony. So what is it about all this evidence? Why do we need evidence if everyone is telling us, I just believe. So I think that yeah. we have an obligation to be faithful to the word of God. Uh, I, I think what is an essential for salvation? Uh, it is belief in Jesus, uh, but the, the right Jesus, the second God, or, I mean, not the second God. I'll get myself in trouble with that one right there, right? And there we have a Freudian slip from an apologist right out of his own mouth. Of course, Christianity is dismissed by Jews and Muslims because it's polytheism. Jesus is a God. Jehovah's a God. The Holy Spirit is a God. The biggest doubt struggle that I had, Melissa, in the Bible for me, um, it it's what I would refer to the seemingly absurd, the apparent ridiculous. Well, Bobby's mentioning the seemingly absurd. Well, to those of us that aren't Christians, it's not seemingly absurd. It is absurd. It's no such thing as talking donkeys and talking snakes. And it's obvious that the earth wasn't created in six days, just a mere six to 10,000 years ago. Now, in uh, the original video I'll link below, this is a former skeptic response to the toughest objections to Christianity. Uh, Bobby Conway uh, talking about his new book and talking about his struggles as a skeptic as he was a Christian pastor and apologist on um, Melissa Doherty's show. Now, just, I hate to read stuff, but just bear with me one second. I talked with my friend Bobby Conway to talk about some crushing doubts he had as a pastor and a Christian apologist. He's a man who had genuinely struggled with the questions, wrestled with doubts, and emerged faithful on the other side. Now, I'd like to point out, Melissa, I'm sorry, but but Bobby was never a real skeptic. Bobby never had real doubts. Because you know why we know this? If Bobby was a real skeptic and had real doubts, he would have become an atheist. You see how ridiculous that sounds? That's the same hateful, bigotry, God-awful stuff that comes out of your mouth, Melissa, all the time. When you degrade and dehumanize people by, by claiming, people like myself, that we didn't love Jesus with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, we weren't dedicated to Jesus. We didn't feel filled with the Holy Spirit. And we weren't as much of a Christian as you are. I was for 38 years. And every time I listen to you speak, I want to vomit. It's disgusting. We were real Christians. Because real seeking for the truth, and this is true whether you're an atheist, a Buddhist, a Muslim, a Mormon, a Christian of any stripe, if you really care about the truth, you have to set aside your dogmas, your presuppositions. And the reason, Melissa, that you guys are afraid of people like me is because we spent so many years as Christians, you can't deny and say, oh, you haven't considered everything. I did consider everything. I went on missions trips to foreign countries. I led Bible studies. I led youth groups. I led home groups. I tithed, I gave offerings, I worshiped the Holy Spirit with my hands up, I spoke in tongues, I cared about people, and by the way, I still care about people actually more. I'm a nicer, better person now as an atheist than I ever was as a Christian. And the stuff you guys spew this nonsense is terrible. It's just disgraceful. Um it's the, the parts of the Bible, like, you know, where Nahum's dipping in a river seven times. Uh, you have the talking donkey. Uh, you have the ox goad Shamgar taking out 300 people. And at times I just felt like this feels so absurd. Like I feel like, um, you know, and then I would listen to Christians say, oh, Mormons believe this and they believe this. And I'm like, yeah, well, have you read our Bible lately? We believe some pretty crazy things too. It's like, it's not like we're off the hook here. And this, and this is true, Bobby. This is very true. 
The Bible has absurd stuff and you're not off the hook. And it's funny to me, I sometimes get comments from ex-Mormons who say, wow, it's, it's weird hearing Mormonism used as the standard of how people can know Christianity is not true because you can point out how Christians dismiss Mormonism out of hand because it's so silly. Well, guess what? What did Paul do? Paul had an experience. What did Joseph Smith have? An experience. Were either of these experiences backed up by other people that we can verify, that we can name? No. These people came up with a new gospel. They changed the teaching of the path. This is why Paul had many fights with uh, Peter and Barnabas, because he was teaching new things. Jesus said he came not to do away with the law, that all, every jot and tittle. The early Christians were Jews. They followed the law. They followed the Sabbath. They didn't eat pork. Paul came along and changed all that, just like Joseph Smith came along and changed things to meet what he wanted. Paul and Joseph Smith are analogous. Can you introduce yourself? Can you tell my audience who you are, what you're about, what you do, um, yeah. all the things? Sure. So I basically grew up in California, never heard the gospel until I was 19. I was a big partier. Uh, you know, I was the guy trying to uh, find uh, myself through taking hits of LSD and sitting in rooms watching Pink Floyd, The Wall and tripping out with my buddies. I mean, you know, just Dinner. yes, just doing the stupid stuff, right? Okay. Drinking. Uh, and I had my college baseball teammate it took me to hear Greg Glory, and mm -hmm. I placed my faith in Christ. Uh, and then I was still struggling, though, in the throes of addiction. At 21, I ended up, uh, you know, getting clean. Uh, from alcohol, doing over 400 meetings of sobriety in my first year. And I just caught fire for Christ. And okay, this is a very common story. Now, um, much of my Christian life was spent in Southern California, so I'm familiar with Greg Laurie. I'm, I'm familiar with, uh, you know, the Calvary Chapel. So I think Melissa goes to a Calvary. Um, you know, this comes out of um, Chuck Smith. The church that I was part of, the Vineyard Movement, came out of Calvary Chapel, but then they got a little too crazy, so Chuck Smith asked them to leave. And um, now Chuck Smith and Calvary Chapel were were part of the Jesus People Movement, Lonnie Frisbee, which is a whole other interesting story. I bring that up because um, Bobby just mentioned dropping acid. Now, notice in his story. He, he hadn't heard the gospel till he's 19. He gets saved. He has an experience. Now, Jesus didn't heal him miraculously overnight of alcoholism or being an addict or whatever he was. What happened? He worked for a year. He said he'd go to over 400 meetings, and he got himself clean. Now, this happens quite often. I, I, my mom was a pastor that worked in recovery stuff, so she did, you know, the, the vineyard had its own, it had a... Um, celebrate recovery which i think came out of rick warren's church it had a, a group called care christian adults in recovery which were start by the mackies um uh which um that's a whole nother story the the story the vineyard stories and all the all these interrelationships are fascinating every one of them could be hours of discussion but let's let's stick on topic here Southern California and these big mega churches and these big rallies. Like I went to Promise Keepers in the Coliseum in LA with, you know, all my Christian buddies. These things are common and you you feel these emotional things. And when somebody gets saved as a teenager and they dedicate their lives to Jesus, and even you know, one of the things Bobby just said, I was on fire, and you know, his whole testimony is about emotion. It's about feeling Jesus saved him from something. Now Interestingly enough, my, like my story is kind of like the opposite. I feel like I got saved when I got out of the church. I was in my 50s, and then I'm dropping acid and doing molly and partying and experimenting. And to me, that was like, okay, I had, I had spent my early, I had spent my 20s changing diapers and raising kids. If you've listened to apologists, there's a common theme. People grow up and a Christian home and they love Jesus and they make some dedication to them in their teens or in some cases they become Christians in their teens or maybe early 20s but it's it's like Mike Winger has this story like his 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 dad made fun of him or didn't want him to be a Christian but you know he and he's also a Calvary Chapel Southern California guy so I know how that whole story goes you get accepted by the group 
It's the same thing cults do, except it's more a little bit more mainstream, so you don't recognize it as being, you know, the love bombing isn't so egregious and the and the stuff isn't weird. It seems normal. So you just go along with it. And though none of those people and, and this was confirmed to me. Not when when I did when I did a the live stream with Mike Lacona, he you know, I said, Mike, you weren't studying Greek text when you were 10, 11, 12 years old, right? Like you believed you were on fire for Jesus. The feeling a tug to ministry. And I would go off and prepare for the ministry and go to Bible college, get married and go to seminary. And then after seminary, I planted a church. Then I would start a YouTube channel called One Minute Apologist while pastoring. And then somewhere along the way, while I was pastoring and I had the YouTube channel, which by the way, goes by the name, Christianity Still Makes Sense Today, I switched the name. Oh. Uh, I found myself in the throes of doubt wondering what is going on. Um, I was questioning things that that made sense to me. And I got to this place where Christianity wasn't making sense whatsoever. And I was hanging by a thread wondering, am I going to be an apostate? And the pressure was overwhelming because I had the responsibility to be putting out new videos uh, every week on apologetics. And I'm going through all these doubts but I hated my doubts. And so I was preaching by faith, doing apologetics by faith. Um, I wasn't like celebrating my doubts. I was just in the middle of a serious battle. And so I ended up coming from a place where Christianity didn't make sense, thinking I might be an apostate, being brought through that dark night of the soul after several years, actually. I mean, it was agonizing um, what I went through. And then I would end up writing this book that comes out April 23rd with Tyndale. And so those that are watching, depending upon where they are in this journey, because YouTube videos stay around for a while, uh, this video, if you're watching in 2035, uh, the book came out April 23rd, 2024 with Tyndale. So Bobby falls in love with Jesus and he goes off to Bible school and then he's a pastor and he's got a YouTube apologist channel. And he starts having doubts. Now, there's a lot of stories out there that are very similar to his, but the doubts come to their fruition and the people leave the church. You can listen to YouTube influencers like Apologia, or you can, um, I mean, you can read many, many, many stories, whether it's Bart Ehrman and Dan Barker, et cetera, et cetera. The... The thing is here, notice what he says. He thought he might be a heretic. This is one of the same things when I did when I did my live stream with Mike Lacona, one of the things he he said when when he had been going through some internal struggles and doubts was was the the fear of hell. So there is a strong incentive not to leave the flock. It's built in to the system. In fact, in, in some of the Old Testament commandments, if your brother or, you know, your fellow, your fellow Israelite, Israelite leaves Yahweh and goes chasing other gods, you're supposed to kill him. So there's a very strong built-in mechanism to stop apostasy. And so, yes, it's a very difficult struggle. So, you know, I can empathize with Bobby's struggle and how he talks about it, but there's this arrogance, this arrogance that Melissa has especially, and it's so disgusting, that the only people that are, that are true, that care about the truth, are those people that overcome the doubts and stay in Christianity. And everybody that decides that the evidence is not strong enough, and the belief system, they just can't believe. The belief system falls away because they can't believe. They can't will themselves to believe something that's unbelievable to them. Those people are dishonest. Those people were never real Christians. Those people didn't care about the truth. They were just looking for an exit. This bigotry, I'm going to continue to call this out on my channel because it's disgusting. You know, Melissa comes across as a nice person, but she is one of the most hateful bigots on YouTube. Her message is disgusting. It's cruel. It's dehumanizing. And I want to say another thing about Bobby. It's obvious one of Bobby's struggles was homosexuality because he comes across as very effeminate and very 
Look, I can see it. He he struggled. I, I I would bet my soul on this, and he probably would never admit this in public, but for sure. Just look at his mannerisms and his the way he holds himself. He his his look. Everybody's sexuality is is bisexual. Everybody's a bisexual. I hate to hate to burst your Christian bubbles. That it's not black and white. <sighs> sexuality is a spectrum. That's science. That's obvious. We know this anecdotally. We know this. Yeah. Well, whatever. This is an. I should do. I'll do another video on that. And I thought to myself, wow, this could very easily have been a deconstruction story mm. instead of a. Oh, I I found my faith stronger story. And here's the thing, Melissa, most of these stories do become stories of deconstruction. Why? Because it's obvious to anybody who's open-minded and actually wants the truth that Christianity can't actually be true. Not in the, not in the supernatural sense, not in the dying people coming back to life sense. In terms of the cultural value, fine. I'll surrender that one. You guys want to go to church and you want to help the poor. That's all, that's all great. But the bigotry against other races and other cultures and other sexual orientations and genders and all the stuff that you guys make fun of or mock or degrade or dehumanize and you're bigots against, I'm going to continue to stand against that because it's hateful. And if that's Christianity, I'll take Satan in hell. I volunteer. I'll go to hell. I don't want to be in a heaven with you, Melissa, because I find you a terrible person. What was the difference? So what helped you not deconstruct and what helped you to, uh, you know, refine your faith and solidify it even more? When I was going through uh, my doubts, Melissa, um, the, the torture that I felt internally uh, was beyond words that I could explain. So I'll say sometimes that there are people that, you know, they have their doubts and they celebrate them to move beyond their doubts. Um, I agonized over my doubts and I wanted to go deeper into my relationship with Christ. Okay. If you want to go deeper into your relationship with Christ, then you're not really doubting Christ exists. To doubt Christ exists, to actually be a, a, a real doubter, um, you have to be willing to put on the table that it could not be true. Now, uh, now again, when I, when I talked to Mike Lacona, he said, hey, look, I got to a point where I was 85% my posterior on Christianity being true and 15% my posterior Christianity isn't true, which means he was willing to entertain, even though, you know, like he's a Christian, he believes Jesus rose from the dead, but he's, but he was willing to entertain and he's willing to leave this, this gap that, Hey, I could be deceived. And that's a, that's an honest place to be. Now, if Bobby's going through this quote, doubting period, but he's net, but he, but his whole time he wants to, you know, he wants to have his, his relationship renewed and stronger with Jesus. Well, yeah, that, of course, that's where he's going to land. So, so Melissa's question is like, how did you end up not deconstructing? Well, he didn't want to deconstruct, obviously, because if he, if he, if he really wanted to seek the truth, honestly, and I'm kind of mocking myself and you at the same time, if he was a real doubter, he would have ended up as an atheist, obviously. The, the the funny thing is the funny thing in here is he he makes it sound like like one of the things he says is the his his doubting and stuff was struggling out so later in later in this interview they're going to kind of they're going to kind of act like well the, well the thing that he said about celebrating some people want to celebrate their doubts so Melissa has this weird fantasy belief that that people are people people that deconstruct were looking for exits and that's what this this whole celebrating their doubts. There's this idea that people just wake up one day and they decide, oh, I, I want to go to a party and do drugs so I don't believe in Jesus anymore. Or, oh, I, I, I have some doubts about the six-day creation and young earth creation and I'm an, I, I'll just become an apostate and be an atheist. Go Richard Dawkins. Woohoo! Come on. This is not real life. Bobby, I, I hate to tell you, brother, but your story has been repeated many, 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 many times. And no, most people don't write books and most people don't come on YouTube. So that the anomaly between what you are and what I am is most people don't come out here and expose themselves publicly on camera or write books about this stuff. I had a hard time. 
I had a bottle of vodka and 400 sleeping pills on the desk right here in front of me. And I had to call my son. Now, that's not a phone call you ever fucking want to make in your life when you have to call your own child and, and get walked off the cliff. Deconstruction is not easy when you really, really, really love Jesus. But fuck you, Melissa, for thinking I didn't love Jesus and I wasn't a real Christian. I was a real Christian. And the thing is, I couldn't, I got to a point where I couldn't believe that God exists, at least the Christian God. Look, I'm, I'm still willing to admit there could be a God out there, but we just don't know about what he wants or she wants or it wants. It's certainly not the Abrahamic God. This is obvious to anybody that actually cares about truth. But coming out of that, and the reason I know and I can empathize with Bobby's emotional stuff is I also went through that. And I've heard this story over and over from many other influencers and other people, both publicly on YouTube and in private conversations. People struggle with this, especially if they were born and raised into a very strong religious family. It is very difficult. It's very difficult. But that doesn't mean that people that decide it's not true that they're somehow being dishonest or that the whole, or they, they just didn't believe like I was pretending to believe in Jesus for 40 years. Come on. It's ridiculous. But I felt duped for a season. Uh, and anybody who has an authentic love relationship with Jesus, and then to have that threatened where you wonder if you were duped and you spent your life preparing uh, as an adult to be in the ministry. You've developed a Christian worldview, and now it all feels broken. Well, I didn't know how to live. I, I was in torment. I ended up in counseling. I ended up on antidepressants. I had um, quite a bit of suicidal ideation. Um, my my I, my family saw the, the the depression that I was in, and the reason it hit me in, in such a visceral way was because Jesus was so meaningful to me, and because He did change my life. And now I was like, well, where do I go from here? How, how do I deal with this? So I think the difference is that some of the people that are deconstructing, uh, it's, it's, it's as if they're having a celebration around their doubts. Like, mm -hmm. oh, and, and, and they just love sitting in skeptic's corner. And you almost wonder sometimes, I th you know, how real their faith was. Yeah, well, fuck you too, Bobby. Our faith was real, as real as yours. Now... Listening to that last clip again, I'm, I'm even more convinced you were struggling with homosexuality. And you know what, Bobby? I'm sorry that the church put on these lies to you. And, that, and you also said you were, some, you were a baseball player. So we know that there's this sort of what they call in Mexico, a machismo attitude. It's, it's difficult to be, even today, even in reasonably progressive times, it's still, if you're in a, if you're in a male-dominated um, culture, sports, you know, He-Man, Redneck, Guns, and Jesus. It can be very difficult to, to even know how to deal with or how to talk to anybody about those feelings. But I want to tell you right now, Bobby, or anyone else is listening, it's okay. I needed to break in here. Just a, just a quick edit. I, I am in no way saying that I know that, that Bobby struggled with or it does struggle with or has struggled with homosexuality. It's pretty obvious to me. That's my judgment. I'm expressing my empathy for the, uh, the struggle and the hurt that he had to go through, assuming my impression is, is correct. Um, Orange County environment that I lived in, like this was, you know, the, the, it, it wasn't accept, it was not socio socially acceptable. Oh, silly dog. Anyone that's followed my channel for a while knows silly dog's my favorite little buddy. Mm? Oh. No, don't growl at me. I love you. You're a good boy. Mm? Oh. Yeah? Are you a good boy? What do you think? You want to be on, you want your own podcast, huh? You want a Chewini podcast? I'm going to play, I, I took a little clip and I'm going to just play I'm going to play this clip a couple times. Well, just just listen to the clip. My that's my, 
my, my point here should be obvious if you just listen to this next clip repeated a few times. I ended up on antidepressants. It's like I ended up on antidepressants. It's like I ended up on antidepressants. It's like I ended up on antidepressants. And again, I mean no disrespect and I mean nothing. And I'm not using this as a, well, it, it is what it is. And here's what I would suggest to you. Move somewhere where it's safe. I would suggest Guadalajara because Guadalajara is the LGBT capital of Mexico. It's way more free than living in America. Being here is amazing. The weather's great and it's cheap. So Bobby, I, I, if anybody knows Bobby, send this to him. Hey Bobby, come down here. Well, I'll keep it a secret. I'll, I'll introduce you to some of my gay friends and you can, you know, you can, ex you can experience the other side. I guarantee you that if you are willing to be honest with yourself and live your true self, you will leave behind Christianity because all the stuff that you struggled with knowing was absurd and bizarre is still absurd and bizarre. You just convinced yourself it was true for whatever reasons, including your own shame and guilt and probably your ministry and your life, and you'd built your whole life around who you were, and it's very hard to, it's very hard to leave that. I get it but it's so much more free. You're so much happier. And it's funny listening because I know, look, I, I've, I've struggled with depression on and off in my life, but I have never been depressed as an atheist like I was as a Christian, never. Like, it's like night and day. Now, I'm not saying atheism is a cure-all or a, it's not a panacea for anything, obviously. But, Leaving, leaving aside Christianity and the reason, like, I'm going to do a little self-diagnosis now. This is just my, this is, this is just the way I perceive it for me. The way I perceive it for me is a lot of my depression as a Christian was my, my lack of understanding why God didn't love me like he loved other people. Like, why are those people in, in ministry? Why did they get to go to Bible college or why do they get to be, celebrated and do the things they want to do. And I don't, why doesn't God love me? Like I want to do all these things for Jesus and he doesn't seem to care. And that led to massive depression. And also going, I mean, going back into my teens, just thinking about the tragedy, the tragedies in the world and the pain and the suffering and, and my inability to solve these problems and my desire to, and my love for people. It's like, it drove me almost crazy. Getting out of that system, when you realize that it's most likely we live in a naturalistic world in which evolution drove us, drove our early ancestors in, into a niche, which included consciousness and a brain and being able to think and wonder why we're here. If you accept that, that, that that's likely the case, I mean, that's all the evidence leads to that, then... Yes, you can become a fatalist, sure. You can become a nihilist and jump off a bridge. You know, you can, you can, you can read Camus and be depressed or whatever if you want. Or, or you can celebrate the one life you have and you can get enjoyment from loving other people and be, and be selective because some people are emotional vampires. Now, when you're a Christian, you're told... Yeah, I mean, you are told, well, you got to have good boundaries, but you also are subject to emotional vampirism in Christianity way more than as an atheist. As an atheist, if I don't want to talk to somebody or be around somebody, I don't have to excuse it or explain it or nothing. But when you're a Christian and you're at like a home group or something, then, you know, it's all this, you know, there's all this shit put on you. Come on, Bobby. Let's uh, look. I know Melissa is probably a lost cause, but Bobby, well, you could still be safe, brother. I'm serious. Come down here and I'll show you around. Give yourself a couple months. You'll come out the other side clean, free, happy. You don't have to live in the chains of Christianity, honest. Um, now, there are certainly people that have been through the ringer uh, as well. Uh, but in full transparency, I don't know that I've ever met another person that I feel like has been wrecked by doubt as much as I have. Now yeah, you still cling to the narcissism there, buddy. You're you're not alone in these doubts. It's just most people, like I said before, aren't as they are not on YouTube or writing books. And 
this this look at everybody's unique i know but the idea that this is somehow this story is somehow unique or special is just bullshit that's not to say i haven't met another person it's not to say that there aren't other people but my family and the people that were close to me what they saw me go through uh, i'm speaking from you know legit experiments experience here it was hard and i think the thing that helped me instruct i wanted to hold on to my faith I and there you go people i wanted to hold on to my faith he said so all this talk about searching for the truth and how important the truth is is complete fucking bullshit if you really want the truth you can't say i wanted to hold on to my faith because even if the faith is true let's just say i'm completely wrong about christianity it's true Jesus is true, the Bible's true, I'm going to hell, and et cetera. But, I mean, that's certainly, some version of Christianity, I guess, could be true. Now, all of them can't be true because they contradict each other, but one specific one maybe is true. Let's imagine, that, let's imagine that's the case. Okay, fine. You still would have to put that aside if you were seeking truth as a doubter and a skeptic. You couldn't say, I, I want this to be real, and, but I'm skeptical and doubting and I'm, and I'm trying to search for the truth. That's not how it works. It's not how science or any, any truthful investigation works. Now, I'm not saying like if you're, going to look, if you're going to look for the Loch Ness Monster, fine. You can say I grew up my whole life as a kid loving the idea of a Loch Ness Monster. And I really want to find it or I really want to find fairies or whatever. Oh, yeah, okay. I get it. But if you go into hunting for the Loch Ness Monster with the idea in your head, I want to find the Loch Ness Monster, and I believe the Loch Ness Monster is there, and I'm and I'm not and I'm, like I have doubts about it, but I but in my mind I'm I'm you know I, I I have a relationship with the Loch Ness Monster. Then your your investigation into the Loch Ness Monster is going to lead you to evidence that convinces you that it's true, mysterious, and not. You know, you, you have to have faith and you, you know, you can't just, you can't just glorify in your doubts if you want to believe in the Loch Ness Monster. Now, Bobby's admitting stuff here that, that goes back to this little joke that sort of proves the joke. He was never a real skeptic. He was never a real doubter. Why? He just admitted he wanted it to be true and he wanted to save his relationship with Jesus. And that was his struggle. And that's where I wanted to offer hope. Like here I am in that place during my doubts. And I actually sit here today and I go, well, I had to renegotiate my faith stance. Uh, I didn't end up walking away from the faith. Mm -hmm. I'm okay handling doubts when they come my way. But I believe stronger today uh, when I consider these other worldviews in the worldview of Christianity. And I'm so thankful that he brought me through that. And I do think that people that deconstruct, they throw the talent. I mean, look, no one wants to be in pain and doubting hurts. Um, mm -hmm. But I was literally, truly walking by faith. Though I felt like I had no faith, I look back, that's what was going on. I was by faith meeting God through all of those doubts that I was hammered with. If if Bobby was, quote, walking th in faith through this whole ordeal, then he was obviously not pursuing truth from a position of a clean slate, which that's fine if you want to do it that way, but it's, that's not how you get the truth. Sorry, if you're struggling with doubts, but the whole time you're still praying to Jesus and asking Jesus and wanting Jesus to be real and you're and you're still clinging to some belief that Jesus is real then yeah okay the fact that you stayed a Christian isn't surprising now I realize this creates somewhat of a conundrum if you believe in Jesus you can't just not believe in Jesus to struggle through the doubts obviously if you believe in Jesus you believe in Jesus but you can't you can't say I want it to be true and I'm working to make it to be true, but I'm also working for truth. Because if a Muslim said that or a Hindu said that or a Mormon said that to you, you would clearly object and you would say, 
if you're not willing to question that Joseph Smith or Muhammad weren't sent by God, if you're not willing to put that aside, like you can't not believe what you believe. But if you if you can't put that aside, at least theoretically and really openly and honestly challenge yourselves with Socratic questions and really want the truth, if you're not willing to do that, then you'll never give up the things that you're that you're continuing to believe on faith. You that's that's how this works. Yeah, it sounds like the big difference is uh, as simply as I can put it. Greg Kokel says this that you know looking for answers, not exits. Yeah, and that's and those well said. yeah, like there's there's two very different things about it. Where okay, Greg Kokel is another manipulative fuck. So Greg Kokel produces a series like how to manipulate people into believing in Jesus. Now, he's one of the worst of the worst. Then this idea of looking looking for answers instead of exits. You know, Melissa, this is, this is just, this is one of these bullshit deepity things that really, like, it's just another thing that's stupid. It, it, you, people that are looking for answers, in other words, looking for truth in a real way, in a, re, in a real way, in a, in, and actually care what the truth is, one, they can't, they can't stick to an answer, right? And two, you have to be willing to go where the evidence leads. When you say that, you're just dehumanizing people and you're, and you're, and you're slandering and libeling and bullshitting people. And this phrase, looking for answers and not exits, it, what you're saying, you're, you're, you're decrying somebody that would be looking for an exit because what you're saying, a hidden in there, is my is my sane objection for quote looking for answers? If you're looking for answers, meaning Melissa, you've already you're already a hundred percent sure Jesus is real. You're just looking for answers of things that are troubling or absurd or confusing or you know that you have doubts about theology. But you but but you're looking for quote answers to stay in the faith because you know that you know that you know Jesus is real. Well, that would be just the same error as somebody quote looking for exit exits the thing that you're accusing them you're basically accusing them of already deciding that jesus isn't real and they're looking for excuses in the bible or in christianity to use to justify that what they've already decided that it's not real now if somebody if somebody does that i would say okay you're guilty of the same thing you're not really looking for truth if you just decide oh this thing isn't this thing that I believed isn't true, and I and I and and now I'm going to look for justifications why it isn't true instead of coming to a point through whatever process you go through to believe it's true or not true. Now, generally speaking, this happens sort of naturally. I didn't I didn't wake up one morning and say, "Oh, hey, I don't believe in God no more." That, and and if you listen to people's testimonies about their deconstruction, I've never heard anybody say. Oh, I decided one day I didn't want to be a Christian and I didn't want to believe. So I went, I went to look for exits. It's just a stupid fucking thing, Melissa, that you say. Don't quit saying it. You sound like a moron, and it's also dehumanizing, degrading, it's insulting, and it and it's a lie. You're supposed to be a Christian, be a truth seeker. People that end up deconstructing aren't looking for exits. People that deconstruct are looking for some sort of truth, some semblance of order in the universe, and they're confused about this stuff they've been taught about, and it doesn't make sense to them. And in, in some cases, like in Bobby's case here, he worked out, oh, it is all true after all. But by and large, I think people that go through this end up realizing, hey, at least some of this stuff is BS, like Noah's flood, and the earth is 6,000 years old, and evolution's a lie. People, most most people that aren't, you know, completely off the ranch of, of logic, reality, accept those things. And then they start saying, wait a minute, if, the, if Noah's flood is just a story and a myth, and it's based on Gilgamesh's myth, mythological earth flooding story, and if Adam and Eve aren't actually real literal people, and, well, guess what, the exodus didn't happen, and Moses actually wasn't a real person, and people start realizing, hey, wait a minute, Maybe some of this stuff about Jesus is embellished, like, you know, raising from the dead. And then from there, they go, okay, well, I want to know the truth. Like, wouldn't you want to know the truth? And that's the question, really, you got to ask yourself. If you're a Christian and you think to yourself, 
boy, if Christianity isn't true, I really don't want to know. Well, fine. Stay a Christian. Like, quit being a, don't be a bigot like Melissa. Don't be an asshole. You know, feed the poor. Don't hoard shoes and purses and coats. Give away Give away possessions you don't need and, you know, live like the early church did minus Paul's manipulation. Fine. You know, nobody's going to bother you. Nobody's going to bother you if you're just a good person and you're generous and kind. It's when you become this vicious, manipulative, ugly person who is filled with bigotry and hatred and you couch it in love. Oh, when I tell you you're going to hell for being a gay, I'm really loving you. It's really loving. It's because I love you so much that I'm telling you you're going to hell for being a gay person or whatever, or a Mormon. Look, I don't believe in Mormonism, but Mormons are by and large nice people. And I don't believe in Islam or Hinduism, but I, I think by and large most people tend to be pretty decent people. Now, I don't know. Maybe I'm tainted because I came to Mexico and Mexicans are the fucking most amazing people I've ever lived among. You, you were struggling and grappling, but you wanted to know. You wanted to know if it was right or wrong. No, Melissa. Didn't you listen to him? Or you're not a very good listener, are you? He didn't say he wanted to know if it was right or wrong. He, says, he said over and over again he wanted it to be true and he wanted to, it, he wanted to restore his relationship with Jesus and he was afraid of becoming an apostate. That's not seeking truth. That's, that's struggling with the fact you're in a religion that teaches a lot of ludicrous, ridiculous, illogical things and you don't want to leave it and you don't want to give up your relationship with Jesus who's keeping you from being gay, your true self. And, and it's scary. I, look, I lived in Southern California, so I know what Bobby was facing, especially being a baseball player. And also, you know, he's a big, he's a big, handsome, strong man and, you know, masculine. And inside, he's struggling with these, with these other thoughts. I mean, that's a tough one. I get it. I understand. Again, come down here to Guadalajara. You'll be accepted. You'll be a superstar. You know, older white men down here. <laughs> Dude, even if, if, even if I'm wrong and you're straight, I mean, I guess I don't, you, don't, you haven't said if you're married or not. I'm going to say you're probably not. But I could be wrong, obviously. I pity your wife if you're married. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's what he was saying there, Melissa. He wasn't saying that, oh, I'm trying to figure out the truth. He's not saying that. Don't, aren't you listening to him? if it was true or false, where everybody on this end looking for a reason to not believe, that's, that's easy. Again, Melissa, fuck you. Fuck you. You are, you are such a horrible person. What do you mean it's easy? It was not fucking easy. I nearly suicided over this shit. And I've heard many, many people tell many, many horrific stories of going through deconstruction. It was not easy. It is not easy. They get every single one of my friends, so called friends, abandoned me, Melissa. Not one Christian from my former life stayed in contact with me after I became an atheist. Not one. Not one email or phone call or message, hey, are you okay? Not one. Don't tell me it's easy. In fact, I would argue what Bobby did was the easy chicken shit way out. It wasn't hard to go back and say, friends and family, I was struggling with doubts. I had a dark night of the soul, but I'm back and I love Jesus. He's celebrated. He's got a book deal. He's on your show. That was the, Bobby did the easy thing, not the hard thing. The hard thing is when you follow the truth, regardless of the consequences, that's the hard thing. You are really a bad person, Melissa. It's shameful. Uh, but I think that's, I think a lot of people can really understand your position, especially uh, people who are more cerebral um, in this aspect. I, I completely understand. When I was reading your book, I, I really understood a lot of what you were going through, maybe not to the same degree, of course, but you, we have these questions, you know, just because we have YouTube channels and ministries and fancy degrees or whatever does not mean that we have all the answers mm -hmm. or that we have it all figured out, or we don't have doubts. But you act like the answers are all solved. So when you say, 
oh, we don't have all the answers and we have doubts. What does that mean? You're still, you're still saying that you know what the absolute truth is and that's Jesus rose from the dead and God's real and a specific form of Christianity gets you to heaven and all the other false Christianities and all this other stuff gets you to hell. Why do you think when you when you look at when you look at the percentages among in intelligent um, fields that require intelligence, they, like the hard sciences, quantum physics, physics, chemistry, life sciences, biology, cosmology? Why do you think the overwhelming number of people in those sciences are non-believers? I mean, there's a good percentage of atheists. There's a good percentage of people that are kind of like, well, there might be a God. They're sort of agnostic, or maybe even they're they're kind of in the water of yes, there's a God, but they you know they don't believe in you know dead bodies coming back to life. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that any intelligent Jew and or you know an Orthodox intelligent Jew, like that's probably being redundant. A rabbi, anyone that knows the Tanakh, could explain to you quite easy. You sit down for a couple hours, they could go through it with you in the scripture and show you exactly 100% why Jesus cannot be the Messiah. It's impossible. It's made up. Do you think these smart people are actually stupid when it comes to that? Why? How is it that there's PhDs in every religion? You know, there's PhD, there's PhD... Mormons, there's PhD Muslims, there's PhD Christians, there's PhD Scientologists, etc., etc. People in the realm of religion, people will, will believe ridiculous things. And we all agree on this because we all agree everybody else's stuff is ridiculous. Intelligent people will, will in a religion, put aside their intelligence because they believe, they have faith. This is axiomatic. But if, you, but if you look at a different selection, if you just say, hey, let's select for people that are PhDs in a field like quantum mechanics or chemistry or, or evolutionary biology, and then ask how many, what percentage of that group are born-again evangelicals, and it's going to be a much tiny percent. Why? Why is that? You, misrep you misrepresent the other side in straw man so much, Melissa, it's terrible. And then you call yourself an intellect. No, you are a brainwashed, indoctrinated robot who fell in love with Jesus in one night. Like you, by your own testimony, you were completely changed and you were a new person in one night where you even admit you didn't even understand doctrines like the Trinity or you did, obviously you, you couldn't have in 24 hours learned the Bible. So completely on emotion, you became a Christian. And then everything you study and everything you do is to confirm what you've already accepted is absolutely true. But that's not how science is done. It's not how truth-seeking, not how historical studies are anything. Not, nothing in life that you want to find out the truth about can be, can, that, the path to that truth can't start with the answer. But that's not truth-seeking. That's fantasy. That's what children do. Do you understand? Do you understand you're not an intellect, Melissa? You're not an intellect at all. What you are is a brainwashed, indoctrinated uh, apologist for hatred. And it's very, very sad. And I don't think you're a stupid person. And you just have a lot of stupid ideas. And the reason is, is because religion, and this is axiomatic, and you agree with me with every other religion, it's because religion makes people believe stupid shit. And you agree with me when it comes to everybody else, don't you? When you, when you talk about Hinduism or New Age beliefs or Mormonism or Jehovah's Witness or Scientology, you think people believe ridiculous things. Even smart people re believe those ridiculous things. By what function do those smart people believe those ridiculous things? And how is it that you think you are not being affected in the same way they are? You think you're in a special group. So if we group all the smart people in ridiculous religions, you think that you're not in that group. If we made a Venn diagram, you'd be, oh no, I don't belong in that bubble. I'm in the bubble over here of really smart intellectual people that believe ridiculous things that aren't actually ridiculous. Even by Bobby's own, out of his own mouth, he said the things are absurd. But you believe them, even though you're really, really smart, 
because you know that you know in your heart because you had this amazing experience in one day. I wish you could hear yourself objectively. Then you would fall on the ground and weep for all the audience members that you've been deceiving, all the people that you've been holding in this trap of these lies. Because the, the thing that you do now, Melissa, is no different at all from when you were a new ager. Nothing has changed other than the labels. The mystical, magical stuff of Jesus doing magic that doesn't work. It's no different from the new age stuff. You know, if, if you just manifest, it's the same thing. Prayer is just, a, it's just another word for trying to manifest things. You, are, you haven't changed. The leopard has not changed its spots. The zebra still has the stripes. Melissa, you are the same con artist that you were before. Lying to people, deceiving people. Just a different label, a different package. It's leaning into those doubts, though, and and realizing that truth will stand on its own, well, that it's okay to, yeah, like, that's what, that's ultimately what this is about. And you said something in your book that really lives rent-free in my head, that you said, what is it? That it's not about exclusivity, it's about truth. This is Melissa's way of saying, I'm not really a bigot. Sorry, Melissa. Sorry, you are a bigot. Christian exclusivity is bigotry. Even if Christianity is true, its very nature is bigotry and hatred against the other. Otherwise, there would be no doctrine of hell. Any God that would make people and put them in a place in which hell and eternal punishment for limited crimes in a short lifespan in a life that you have very little control over the circumstances of what well, you have no control over the circumstances of your birth. You have very little control in your childhood and the somewhat, the, the some amount of control that you get if some sort of free will and um, compatibilism is true as you, that you get into your older teens and early twenties is still limited. It, Christian exclusivity is not about the truth. Christian exclusivity is about making people like you, Melissa, feel good, that you're better than other people. I'm special. God loves me, don't you know, to quote Sam Harris. This kind of faith is, is really is the perfection of narcissism. I mean, God loves me, don't you know? Any God, Melissa, that would love you and hate me and send me to hell, it's not worth my time. It's not worth my worship. And I'll publicly, I've said this many times, I'll say again, I will stand with Satan if your version of Christianity or your version of religion is true. Because I don't give in to totalitarianism and I don't give in to bigotry because that's what it is. You can call it something else. It doesn't change what it is. It's not a, yeah, it, there was something very good about the way that you said that and the way that you put it, that whenever we're looking for answers, we're trying to be inclusive. We're trying to include everybody. Yeah, Melissa, that's called being a good person. You try to include everybody. Now, when should you exclude people? Well, if they're sociopathic serial killer murderers, they need to be separated from society. Pedophile priests, kidnappers, rapists, yeah, we, we need to separate these people from society. But for everybody else who is not actively out defrauding or, you know, stealing and pillaging and those kind of things, then they get to be included in humanity because guess what? They're human. And I find this exclusivity and these rules that, oh, somebody's on the inside and somebody's on the outside. Even inside of Christianity, it's disgusting. But it's even more disgusting because it tends to break down on long racial lines. Western Europeans and those that, that left Western Europe for the Americas tend to be Caucasian, you know, Brits, British and 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 Germanic and, you know, Northern Europeans and so forth. It tends to be very racist. And, it, and 
this idea that, oh, we're not exclusive. We're just about the truth. You keep telling yourself that lie, Melissa. Go ahead. It just makes you a god-awful person. But the problem is, is that if it's true, well, man, that, that excludes certain things if it's actually true. Notice how she says it excludes certain things because apparently she, even Melissa has enough humanity and empathy left not to say it excludes certain people. She doesn't want to publicly say that. So she says it excludes certain things. No, bitch, you're talking about human beings. And it's ugly and it's bigotry, it's dehumanizing and it's gross. You are a gross person and you're dishonest. Don't say it excludes certain things. You're talking about it excluding other humans. You're talking about a God that would apparently in your worldview allow a little child to be born to Mormon or Muslim or, or Hindu parents and then go to hell because they respected and honored their parents and, and the culture they grew up in. That's your God. It's disgusting. And this doctrine is disgusting. And it is exclusionary. It's bigotry and it's racist. And it's disgusting. You need to check yourself and your ideas. They're horrible. You're a horrible person for spouting this nonsense. These evil, evil, terrible doctrines. If a God exists and he is the way you describe, then the only sane response is rebellion against this God, even if it costs you everything. Because I would rather go to hell and be punished in solidarity to my brothers and sisters in humanity than to be part of a small group that goes on the narrow road to your heaven, Melissa. I was inundated with um, so much information and for every book that I read to try to hash out the answer to the question I was in search of, I collected more questions and doubts. There was an interesting live stream with uh, Dr. Kip Davis, Dr. Josh Bowen, and on with Derek of Myth Vision. And, and Dr. Bowen said something about going down this hallway and you see the open door at the end and there's like a library and from, you know, so many feet away, 50 feet away or so, you, you see this information and you think you have knowledge and you move a little bit farther down the hallway and you see more and you think, wow, I've really gained even more knowledge. But what you don't realize is all the stuff that you can't see. And I've heard him say this before um, and I've heard other thinkers say this before. This isn't original. The more you know and learn, the more you realize you don't know. So when Bobby's saying that the more questions he asked and the more books he read, then the more questions he had, yeah, that's how it works, dude. That's how knowledge works. The more you know, the more weird it is. You ought to start reading some stuff by like Max Tegmark and um, other quantum physics and, and, and study a little cosmology and read some, read some, uh, read some Greg Egan hard He's a hard sci-fi guy that, that delves into quantum physics. The, the, or, or read, some, read some of Nick Bostrom's papers or listen to, listen to him speak a little bit. You go down a rabbit hole. It's like Alice in Wonderland. That's how it works. What you turned around and did, Bobby, was you decided, nah, this, this old holy book that's two, 3,000 years old, it's got all the answers and all this new information and all these new questions, blah, poo on that, poo on those new questions. What you did was you gave yourself a lobotomy. The quest for knowledge, it, it truly taken means you realize you're dumber and dumber and dumber every day you get smarter. That's how it works. And if you're looking for easy pan answers, fine, but don't think you're looking for the truth, brother, because you're not. You're not looking for the truth. You're looking for sweet pan pants answers. Yes, Jesus loves me because mommy and daddy told me so, and the Bible, and my friends, and my congregation loves me, and I get my salary from being a Christian, and I have all these wonderful feelings in my heart when I give myself to the Holy Spirit. So it's got to be true. And, and, you know, asking more Socratic questions and reading more books about things that that hurts my mind. I don't want to do that. 
and it's painful. Doubts are painful. Bobby, you've chosen to be a child. And, I, and as a Christian, you can, you, you don't take that as an insult. You're a child of God. And unless you become like a little child, you can't, you can't run up and sit on Jesus' lap. Now, can you? I was taught that. And, you said, and so were you. Anyone that's a Christian knows what I'm talking about. Remain childlike. Remain faithful. Don't question too much. That hurts your mind. Those, th those questions hurt. Those doubts hurt. You don't want to go down that path. Look, dude, if you make your money being a Christian, fine. Don't lie to yourself. Lie to everybody else. I mean, I, I find it a little bit disgraceful. I like, I like seeking truth and being as honest as I can. But, yeah, I, I won't begrudge you if you got to make a living. But don't lie to yourself. Just admit what you're doing. Be honest. Check the list on this. Well, eventually, if you get discipled in one person's doctrines... And then you start getting exposed to alternative viewpoints down the road. When you go through that process enough, it can blow things up. And I think we need to rethink discipleship with new believers from the standpoint of saying something like Christianity is a large box and there are essential doctrines, but there's different ways and views that people can talk around some of these doctrines. And we just want you to not be surprised by the different views when they come. Enjoy learning. Don't try to conquer it. Don't think that you have to just master it all at once. And so mm -hmm. when I was saved, it was kind of like a mature Christian hurries up and they figure out their doctrine. Well, you're committing to doctrines prematurely that you haven't really thought through the alternative positions. So therefore you've just set yourself up for a future crisis of faith, potentially. One of the things you never hear these apologists say is, where they get the doctrine that provides the list of things that are essential. And, and this, is a, this is a doctrine that everybody sort of has running in the back of their head. Well, if you don't believe in the Trinity, you're not a real Christian and you're not going to heaven. If you don't believe in the revelation of Joseph Smith, you're going to miss out. If you don't venerate Mary and believe that the wafer and the wine really turn to the body and blood of Christ, and you don't believe in the traditions of the Catholic Church, you're probably going to have to go to purgatory or something. Yada, 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 yada. What, what Bobby is talking about here, and this is, this is when you listen to people like, when you listen to people like Tim Burnett and Elisa Childers, who were on Melissa's show, and I did a, I did a video on their, you know, their book on deconstruction. When you, when you listen to them, there's this, there's this undercurrent where they, of, oh shit, we better not be, t we, we, we can't be too dickish because then we're like, we're becoming so exclusive that the club is shrinking smaller and smaller. And so we don't want to do that. We don't want to offend 90% of Christians. So we have to, we have to have it. We have to be a big tense. We have to agree on. So what do they do is they somehow have a doctrine of what the doctrine is that allows you to be a, tro quote, true Christian. Well, where do you get that doctrine? From, does the Bible lay that out? I've never read somewhere in the Bible that says, um, you need to be baptized at this age or in this way or this method, and you have to pray so much or fast or do that. In fact, it seems like this is the grace versus works argument, right? So you read John three sixteen. Whoever believes on Jesus, they will be saved. Oh, but if you believe on Jesus, but it's got to be the right Jesus. Okay, fine. Well, did Jesus make the world in six literal days, 6,000 years ago, and were Adam and Eve real? Like, that would be one Jesus. And then people will come along and say, well, you, don't have, you, you can believe in evolution and an old earth as long as you believe that, that Jesus created everything, and that, that's still the right Jesus. Well, no, it's not the same Jesus as... As Ken Ham's Jesus, Ken Ham's Jesus made rattlesnakes and mosquitoes as vegetarians. And it wasn't until Adam and Eve sinned and death came into the world that crocodiles started eating meat. You get it? It's the different Jesus. So the Catholic Jesus is different from the Methodist Jesus, different from the Presbyterian Jesus, different from the Calvary Chapel Jesus. But... People like Melissa don't want to go down that path, so they tend to say, well, we do have some strong boundaries, like you got to believe in the Trinity, 
But there's some other stuff that, you know, we can have grace. Not for gays, though. They're going straight to hell. How did you come up with that? Why, why is it like, you know, why aren't you guys out preaching against gluttony and fat pastors like, say, Rick Warren? I have all, all kinds of natural feelings in my life. It wouldn't bother me if there was, quote, a gay gene found. Why isn't he going to hell, like, with the gays? I mean, what's worse, being a glutton, a greedy, rich glutton? I don't know. When I read the Bible, I think Rick Warren is way worse. And so I had to have, I really had to, in my place, come up with an apologetic for the absurd. And this should bother you more than it does, apparently. When you're making up apologetics for things that are absurd, you're asking people to believe things that are obviously not true for reasons that aren't logical. And I... You can't say that you're see that you're a truth seeker, that you want the truth regardless of what it is, if you're willing to believe absurd things. It doesn't mean some absurd things in life can't be true, because some absurd things are true. Yes, but but the general rule is, absurd things should be dismissed because they are absurd, unless there's an extreme amount of reason and evidence to believe it. And this is where Christians jump in with, well, there's so much evidence for the resurrection, So, and Jesus believed the Old Testament, so of course uh, the story of the talking donkey is true because Jesus believed it. Once you go down that road, you might... Then the thing is, if you go down that road, how can you possibly say Mormons are wrong or... Muslims are wrong or Scientologists are wrong. Because once you open that door, you have to open it for everybody if you're going to be fair and logical and reasonable and not a bigot. Can you imagine that there's actually a God in heaven and this God is sitting up there saying, well, I've given them hundreds of totally absurd, ridiculous stories to believe and one of them is true. So... 99% of the people are going to go to hell. And the 1% that got the absurd story right, they get rewarded. Come on. Like, how am I going? And, and because what we do as apologists, yeah, we can talk about logical arguments for the existence of God. We can, we can get real logical and philosophical. And I got to a point where I, I love that stuff. But then I was like, okay, but are the apologists reading the absurd stuff in the Bible that I'm reading? Because we're talking about arguments for the existence of God, excuse me, that make great sense when I'm not even making sense pronouncing existence. <laughs> but there are a lot of things in the Bible. I just kept going, what is going on? And it wasn't because I was wanting to be skeptical. At times, I just felt like, am I being naive? I mean, I mean, Ezekiel laying on his side for 390 days playing with pots and pans. Then he flips over and gives God another 40 days. And it was just like page after page of stuff. That's what I was struggling with. It went against my rationality of trying to understand an ancient day milieu through my modern day lens. Well, somebody lying on their side for a year or even a two years, or I mean, logically, somebody could lay on their side if someone was bringing them food and water and taking away their waste. You could lay on your side your entire life. It doesn't require a miracle. It doesn't sound very fun. You seem to be wanting to not talk about all the things that are completely absurd that couldn't have happened, like raising Lazarus from the dead, Joshua getting the sun to stop in the sky, donkeys talking and snakes talking and the, world, the entire world being flooded. And somehow... Noah rescued platypuses and kangaroos, and they somehow made it from the Middle East to Australia later. Th those are the absurd stories. The, the fundamentalists say if you don't believe those, you're, you're, you're headed towards the path to hell. Just listen to Ken Ham for about three minutes. I mean, it's sort of like killing off brain cells. but. And here you are writing a book about it, how you got past that. Yeah. So what was it that helped you overcome that then? So isn't that interesting? So does Christianity still make sense? Well, I, I, 
I, I'm happy to concede that there are a lot of things that don't make sense to me. Um, but that's not a Christian problem. There are things that don't make sense in any belief system. Mm -hmm. So like the atheists who love to like make it look like, well, they corner the market on reason. Well, it doesn't, they can't make sense of consciousness. They can't make sense of free will. They can't make sense of near death experiences. They can't make sense of objective morality. They can't make sense of um, how something gets here from nothing. So in other words, I would find myself thinking, well, okay, what's your, what's your option, Bobby? Walk out of Christianity uh, because of doubt is the only to walk into another worldview where you're going to inherit another set of doubts. Well, I've converted to Mormonism, and yeah, it doesn't make sense, and there's no his historical evidence to back up that, you know, there was some ancient race building and heading out elephants and camels and horses in North America, and, and Joseph Smith's stories sound like. But if I leave Mormonism, any other thing that I would go into would just leave me with a, some doubt. So I, I, I can't leave. Well, I'm kind of lying now. I'm actually a Scientologist. And I am supremely grateful to Mr. L. Ron Hubbard for the study technology he provided, because I would not be here today if I didn't get that. Yeah, of course, we can't totally understand. We can't totally understand everything in Scientology. It doesn't answer every question. But if I leave Scientology, I'll just have doubts in the, in the other. Bobby, you fucking idiot. Look, atheism... Or, or the lack of belief, or agnosticism, anything where you just, even if you're like a deist, anyone, anything that's out of a, a, a revealed religion, um, and you might even include some forms of pantheism in this. Anybody that's in that camp doesn't have all the answers. We could live in a construct built by, you know, some alien race of maybe a supercomputer AI designed the universe we happen to live in. There's, there's other possibilities, and we could have doubts about that. But it's a different kind of doubt. So when I think about, is naturalism true? And I think, yeah, it's, it's probably true. There's probably no gods, and there's probably no supercomputer avian that made this world, and we probably don't live in a construct, and this is probably it. It's, I don't have any struggling doubts that, that hurt my my mind or my feelings because because I'm not resting my my life or I'm not living my life or I'm not putting my quote hope and trust in you know something happening in the afterlife so there you don't have this this struggle in the conflict that that you seem to be having Bobby when you were struggling with Christianity like if oh if I leave Christianity then I'm still going to be in a system that I'm not going to know everything yeah this is, this is what it's like to be a human. You don't know everything. But what you're clinging to is things that you recognize yourself as being absurd. And you're saying, well, I might as well believe these absurd things because if I don't and I go to some other system, I'm going to have to believe some other absurd stuff. And, I, and I'll admit, if you listen to quantum mechanics guys talk about Everett's multi or, you know, Everett's many worlds and so forth, some of that stuff is bizarre as fuck. But we don't, quote, believe in it. I don't, I'm not, my lifestyle isn't based on whether, whether Everett was right or whether the Schrodinger's equation needs to be worked out with this many worlds idea or not, or whether we live in a multiverse or whether we live in a construct. There's nothing about my life that gives me some sort of angst because I have doubts about what's real. Clinging to Christianity, an ancient religion, basically a cult out of Judaism, which is, you know, goes back 3,000 some plus years. And Judaism itself came out of a Canaanite religion. So just study it. Come on. Yahweh was one's El. He even says in the Bible, I went by another name, El Shaddai. He was, he came out of this pantheon of gods. The Israelites used Yahweh as their war god to take over certain people, groups, and lands. There's nothing really that unique or exciting. They were just very successful about it. In the same way that Muhammad was very successful with the Quran and, and the expansion of Islam. The success of Islam doesn't make it true. And you know, and how many... I don't know, was there 800, 700, 800,000 Hindus in the world? 
my numbers may be off a little bit, but it doesn't matter. There's a massive amount of Hindus. Is the, the, and their religion is very, very old. Is it true? Does it, give me, it answers a lot of things. It makes a lot of sense. It, it, it lines up with quantum mechanics and so forth a little, quite a bit better than Abrahamic religions do. Does that make it true? If you became a Hindu, would you, would you lose all your doubts about everything? Would you know everything? No, of course not. I don't. Maybe, Bobby's right that no matter what, no matter what you end up believing, there's gonna unless you know unless you're just gonna be intellectually lazy and say I know, I know, I know the Bible says it or this book says it or this says it, so I know that's true and that's the end of it. I don't have to think anymore. Unless you're gonna unless you're gonna land on I don't want to think anymore. There's always gonna be more questions. There's always gonna be more frontiers. There's always gonna be things that you know that you don't know but that kind of give you a a splinter in your mind thinking about it. But that's not a reason to, to, to adopt some, you know, going back and believe the same things people did in the, the bronze and the stone age and the iron age when, you know, and all, all this, all this stuff has, all these, all these things have answers in human evolution. It's obvious. You just look at how worldwide a religion grew. Read some Daniel Dennett. The, the, there's a lot of stuff that people want to make into a mystery that really isn't that mysterious. Just because we don't know every single answer doesn't mean something isn't true. Like, for instance, evolution. Evolution's complex. Evolution is confusing at times. Doesn't mean it's not true. Doesn't mean we can't. It, it's a well established fact. That doesn't mean we know every process and everything that happened. We don't know. We don't know every single piece of the history and science behind it that doesn't mean you need to be a christian or a jew or a muslim or a hindu or a scientologist to solve your angst so i would try to pre-think the doubts ahead of time so i just listed some on atheism so i go okay the atheists will object how can god uh, allow people if he exists to suffer the way they did during the holocaust well that's a good question and I wish God would have intervened sooner. He didn't. But what Christianity tells me is that God will ultimately hold Hitler accountable. But to walk out of Christianity because God didn't intervene when I thought he should to inherit atheism where Hitler gets off with it scot-free because he just annihilate on atheism, it wasn't worth the exchange to me. Okay, this is the most asinine thing you could possibly have said, Bobby. Under Christianity, guess who is in hell... With Hitler. Oh, about six million Jews. Think about what Bobby is revealing about his personality here. He is he is less uncomfortable knowing that six million Jews or ten million Jews or a hundred million Jews are burning in hell who are otherwise good people and some of them very orthodox and followed the Tanakh and the laws of Moses and never hurt people and were and were and otherwise were were better than most Christians, but they weren't forgiven. And those Jews are in hell with Hitler. And Bobby's more comfortable with that than the quote atheist position. Not that atheists have positions on these things, but the the atheist and the naturalists say, look. You know, but first of all, he said annihilated. No, that's a religious view that Hitler was annihilated. That's not an atheist view. An atheist view is people die, and that's the end of it. Their consciousness it, it runs on this brain, and when the brain dies, the consciousness dies. Because why? It, you don't have consciousness without a the organic brain. And what? Think about the idea that Bobby thinks it's more just that, that Jews are in hell with Hitler than that everybody just dies and that's the end. I, I want to ask you, if, if you're a Christian or if you, you, know, you believe in some sort of paradise in heaven, I want to ask you this, and this is a serious question. If you could, if you could choose, let's say God's real and he shows up and says, okay, you can choose. I'm going to send 
everyone that's ever been born to hell, unless they fit in, you know, unless they were a Calvinist. And, and so Jews will be in hell with Hitler. That's option one. Or option two is everybody just dies when they die. Would you choose option A and convert to Calvinism if you weren't a Calvinist? I wouldn't. Not in a heart. I, I wouldn't even think about that question. I would say I annihilate everybody. What you guess what? Because I'm the kind of guy that if I have a peanut butter sandwich and a couple friends with no lunch, I divide it up into thirds. That's the kind of guy that I am. Now Bobby's saying he's the kind of guy that if he sees someone starving but they don't believe the right thing, he's going to hoard his peanut butter sandwich and eat it himself because he's chosen and loved by Jesus. It's disgusting, Bobby. Your analogy is disgusting. So in, Bo so in Bobby's angst here, he's basically saying, I would rather, I, I, I dismissed atheism because I couldn't accept the idea that God wouldn't send all the Jews to hell with Hitler because Hitler was a really bad guy. What about all the Jews? What about all the Jews, Bobby, and the Hindus and the Muslims? Or are you are you gonna are you gonna become an, a universalist now? Unless you say everybody is saved, perhaps with the exception of Hitler and Dahmer and Ted Bundy, you're just you're just showing your bigotry and your and you're just and you're just showing you're a terrible person. How could you wish for that? How could you want that? How could you worship a god that designed a system like that? Like I don't agree with Mormons, but I think Mormons are pretty decent people and I would I would hate a god that would send Mormons to hell. I would hate that god. If if that's true, if Melissa's little narrow god of bigotry and hatred is sending Mormons to hell, like again, I do not agree with Mormonism, and I think Mormonism is destructive and it has racism and all that. But by and large, people that are born into Mormonism are little kids and they're innocent and they listen to their mommy and their daddy and their aunts and uncles and their friends and they go to church. They don't, they almost have no choice but to be Mormon. <laughs> yeah, you know, and it's it's interesting because, um, yeah, everything that you're saying, I I, I still to this day, like I'll sit down with my girls and we'll talk about certain things in the Bible. And I'm like, I still have questions about Genesis, you guys. I here I am, yeah. I've been a Christian forever. I have the, you know, go to a fancy seminary, you know, talk to these brilliant philosophical person. I still have questions. You yeah. know, I'm like, I still don't understand a lot of this stuff. Um, but that doesn't mean that because I'm using my brain. No, Melissa, you're not using your brain for this stuff. And we know this axiomatically. Why? Do you think you're smarter than all the Jews that can read Hebrew, that they can read the Tanakh in the original Hebrew, and they study the Bible more than you? Like, a, Let's take an old rabbi who's, you know, 70 years old, and he's been studying this stuff since, you know, his, his uh, bar mitzvah, he's been dedicated. So, you know, he's got like almost 60 years under his belt. You think you're smarter than him? And he can show you conclusively without a doubt that Jesus cannot be the Messiah. If you actually wanted to know the truth, you could sit down with the rabbi and go through the Bible and he could show you why Jesus could not be the Messiah. It's self-refuting. Christianity is self-refuting to anybody outside of it. It's obvious. You are using faith. You are using the emotion. Remember what you said, Melissa, about your... I was a new person after one day. You became a Christian, a true believer in one day with no study. With This has nothing to do with intellect. Zero. It has everything to do with emotion. All the study you do now is just to justify and, pr to, and prove to yourself that your conclusion that you're not willing to give up and that you're stuck on is the truth. So you're just... You go through this study to prove to yourself that what you've already agreed on in your own mind is true is true. That's not, that's not an intellectual pursuit. It's a pursuit of faith. And it's no different from what the Mormons do to justify Mormonism. It's no different from what mo the Muslims do to justify Islam. It's no different from what the Hindus do to justify Hinduism. You're no different. And the fact that you think you're different shows me that you, what the intellect you think you have 
is gone. Now, you might want to call me on this and say, well, Michael, you say, no, I don't know. I don't know shit. I'm fucking stupid. I admit that. I don't know shit. When I don't go around with dogma saying, I know this holy book written 3,000 years ago or 2,000 years ago or whatever is true because blah, 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 blah. And that everybody else in the world in a different religion that's really smart, I know better than them. Because that would be arrogant if I did that. What I, what I do say is, Looking at all the religious claims, they're obviously man-made. So there could be a God, but we don't have any evidence that we know about this God or what, it, what he, she, or it is about. And the evidence in the model, if you study cosmology and quantum physics, which I'm just like I'm at a lay level, I've read some books, I'm not an expert. But when you read that, you go, okay, somewhere in there, this fits the model. This fits the model of the universe that I see. And when I listen to you Christians talk about Christianity, then I look at the actual world, I go, come on, it's, you, you, your worldview is a fantasy. So it's not, this is not an intellectual pursuit. Quit lying to yourself about it. If you want to be a Christian because it feels good, makes you happy, you got friends or your ministry, your job is, is that, you know, you're making money off of Christians being a leader, fine. But don't lie to yourself. It's not intellectually honest. It's not an intellectual pursuit. It doesn't make you smart. And the fact that you can admit, oh, there's some stuff in Genesis I don't understand or don't know. Okay, I'll give you credit for that. At least you're being honest here. But just apply that to everything. You don't know Jesus rose from the dead. It's, a, it's an article of faith. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. Don't lie. Quit lying. It's what's true and real. Um, you know, and then the, the resurrection of Jesus, that's... That's hard one to, to debunk. No, Melissa. The resurrection of Jesus is one of the easiest things to debunk. It's not believed by anybody unless they're a Christian. Think about that for a minute. The miracles claimed in Islam and Mormonism with golden tablets or midnight rides or splitting the moon, the the miracles that are still coming out of India today, right? Raising the dead, levitating, miracle cures. These are all easy to debunk. And you do it every day for everything else. You debunk the New Age stuff and the Islamic stuff and the Hinduism stuff and the Mormonism stuff. You, it, but then you special plead for your own miracles. The... The evidence for the resurrection is pretty much non-existent. If you look at it intellectually, as an honest person who honestly wants to know and understand history, that resurrection of Jesus is easy to dismiss. And if you claim that it's that obvious, what you're also claiming is all these intelligent rabbis and Jews who understand the Tanakh and who actually, you know, are looking for the Messiah, that they're all stupid idiots. They're all dummies. They're ignorant. This is why Christianity historically has been anti-Semitic. Because you have to take that stance, don't you? You claim, Melissa, that you know, that you know the Tanakh better than Jewish rabbis? Are you joking? Can you even read Hebrew? I, somehow I don't think so. So you have this false intellectualism where you think, oh, the resurrection is hard to debunk. Yeah, in your own little narrow-minded view, it's hard to debunk. But in the real world where probably, oh, I don't know, maybe 70% of living humans and probably 98% of all humans that have ever lived are 99%. For us, it's easy to debunk because it's a nonsensical story of mythical fantasy fable that that isn't even original the dying and rising motif is not original jesus was in a long line of other go you know sons of god that that died and rose again and went to heaven and you know ruled with his father or had some other chores come on if you want to say i believe that jesus resurrected because i believe in in miracle faithful things just on faith without evidence because it's faith, 
or without good evidence, without evidence that convinces anyone else, except Christians, that would be fine. But you want to convince me to accept Christianity? Get all the Jews that are Orthodox that understand the Tanakh to all wake up tomorrow and say, yes, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. I've been wrong my whole life, and Jesus is the Savior. If, if Judaism ended tomorrow because everybody became an evangelical Christian, that would be strong evidence. Um, yeah, now, the resurrection, by the way, that was the, that was the golden key for me because it, it, yeah. it, it just went like this. I was like, okay, well, if Jesus rose from the grave, and I looked at the lines of evidence for it and because that's the linchpin, right? Paul says, hey, yeah. um, if Christ is not risen from the dead, then your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Um, Ask yourself, who believes in the resurrection of Jesus? Christians. You will almost never, in fact, I don't know of even one case where somebody goes out investigating the, quote, lines of evidence decides that Jesus rose from the dead and becomes a Christian. The story is always first, I was a Christian. I was saved at 10 or 12, or I was raised a Christian. Even in the cases, if you, if you just read the backstory of J. Warner Wallace and Lee Strobel and others like them, the story goes like this. I was a mean, rotten, ugly atheist, blah, blah, blah. You know, I was an asshole. I was going to get a divorce. I was having these problems. I was this. And then I, I became a Christian. Woohoo! And then in, in, in Lee Strobel's book, he, you know, he even talks about it. It's years later, he goes on this quest as a, a journalist to study, to study about the resurrection in Jesus. Who does he talk to? Only friendly sources. He doesn't talk to any skeptics. His book is all about just confirming what he had believed for years in his heart on faith. And, the, and J. Warner Wallace is the same thing. He's, he's a cop. He picks up a Bible. You know, For whatever reason, he decides he needs a change in his life, and he becomes a Christian. And he studies the Bible. He becomes a Christian, blah, blah, blah. And then he, he has an epiphany. Hey, if I, you know, I can make this stick and make a bunch of money. He probably, who knows if he actually thought he could monetize this as well as he did, but that's what happened when, when he did his cold case stuff, this is all going out post hoc and looking for stuff. There are almost no lines of evidence outside of just Christian claims that Jesus rose from the dead. And we know this is to be true unless you're just going to assign the majority of the world as you know, functional idiots. And it's not like Muslims and Hindus and, and other people that believe in spiritual and faithful things in God. It's, it's not like they're resistant to, to, it's not like they're the same as an atheist. They don't find the story of Jesus' death and burial resurrection as being credible. And the ones that you should count on the most for this is you know, religious Orthodox Jews who understand the Tanakh and they, and they believe and they, and they pray to the same God that you pray to. Why doesn't God reveal to all the Jews that it's obvious that Jesus is, has died and rose again? God hate, does God hate the Jews? Do you really think they're stupid? If, if you can be, if you can just, if you can just be honest, the Jews aren't stupid. They know the Hebrew Bible better than you in the Hebrew. And they and they know for sure that Jesus couldn't have been the Messiah. And once you understand that, you're like, okay, Jesus can't be the Messiah. So your option in that case is, well, realize that the that if if a God exists, we just we just he hasn't revealed him or herself or itself. Or become a Jew. Like, fine, become a Jew. That, at least that, that would make a little bit of logical sense, I guess, if you really believe this God exists, you know, the God of the Bible. But evidence for Jesus, sorry. Sorry. This is not an intellectual pursuit. And if, if Bobby was really going through these doubts and if he was really a skeptic, this is purely my 100%, this is my opinion. My opinion is that Bobby went through personal struggles, that he wasn't a... He wasn't being skeptical and doubtful in the core story because he was still, by his own testimony, wanting it to be true and he was still going to Jesus. He was just struggling with things. 
My guess is, and this is hypothetical, my guess is it had to do with his sexuality. He was struggling with things that he couldn't cope with and that put him through this dark night of the soul. This happens a lot. When he came out the other side, what did he do? Well, he just, you know, now he affirms that the evidence for Jesus is just so obvious. Well, if the evidence was Jesus was, is so obvious, he never would have doubted in the first place. It's not so obvious. It's only true to people who accept it as true on faith. It's not obvious to everybody else. Because why? Obvious reasons. All righty, folks, I want to wrap this up. This is Michael Beverly. Thank you for following along on my channel. I have an open invitation to Bobby or Melissa anytime. I would love to live stream with you and have a dialogue. There's no reason for debating because it's not productive. But I would be happy to talk to you and question you about stuff. And I would love to hear your answers of really tough Socratic questions where you're not just, you're not just repeating the rehearsed lines that you have. You actually can be challenged. I don't think either one of you... Honestly, I don't think either one of you would want to be on that hot seat. Because I think you know in the back of your mind that you're spouting a lot of nonsense, but you've, you've created a life around it. You're making a living off of it. You know, so it is what it is. All righty, folks. I'll catch you on the next one. Again, this is Michael Beverly. Like, subscribe, and thank you very much for following.